Hello class, this is section 7.1 and we are going to discuss the existence of Laplace transforms. In other words, we are going to figure out what conditions are necessary for Ft to have a Laplace transform. And there are really going to be two conditions. One, Ft has to be piecewise continuous at whenever t is greater than or equal to zero. So piecewise continuous is a weaker condition than continuous. And you've seen an example of a continuous function, a piecewise continuous function before. The step function is the one that just has this jump at a. So a piecewise continuous function is simply one that can be written down as finitely many continuous functions, like so. In other words, Ft has to be made up of finitely many continuous parts. So you can't have infinitely many continuous parts, there has to be only a finite number of jumps. And also, as an additional condition, whose endpoints have finite limits. As an example, let's look at this function where gx is equal to 0 when x is less than 3 is equal to log or less than equal to 3 equal to log x minus 3 when x is greater than 3. So what happens here is that we have a function that behaves like this. It's a part that goes to negative infinity and a part that stays at zero. So this has only two continuous parts. However, this endpoint has a limit at minus infinity, so it doesn't have a fi finite limit. So this will not be a piecewise continuous function, whereas the step function is, and this function that we drew is. So that's the con first condition, that Ft has to be made up of finitely many continuous parts, and the endpoints have to behave nicely. You can't go to infinity. Now it's okay if the it's okay if the function goes to infinity at infinity. Like it's fine if the last part goes to infinity, the last interval goes to infinity at infinity. But as long as you you don't reach infinity in for finite x, and it satisfies the first condition. So let's discuss the second condition, and this condition is really a speed limit on f. So we see that f has exponential order if there exists constants m, little c, and big T, so that the size of ft is less than m e c t for t greater than the big T. So in other words, eventually f is going to be smaller than an exponential function. So there's a speed limit for f. So like let's write down some exponential function. So y is equal to m e c t. Our f can exceed it initially, but eventually it has to grow slower than our exponential function for some values of m and c. This condition you don't have to worry too much about. Um, most of the functions that you are familiar with in this class and in previous classes are smaller than exponential. Exponential functions are really the fastest functions that you've had to deal with so far, but there are some exceptions. And as an example, ft equals the exponential of an exponential is not of exponential order. So the exponential of an exponential is faster than exponential. It's not too hard to like, think of uh, why that's the case. Another example is ft equals t raised to t, also not of exponential order. It's easy to see why. In the uh, exponential case, the, the base is just a constant e, and in this case the base is also growing while the power is growing, so obviously it's going to be a lot faster than the exponential. Another example that you've seen is the gamma function. 
And the reason is the gamma function is related to the factorial and I'm sure you've seen many examples in the past of how factorials really grow crazy, crazy fast. So these are some examples of simple functions that are not of exponential order. But in general, everything you're familiar with is going to be of exponential order. Polynomial functions are going to be of exponential order. Exponential functions are obviously of exponential order. Sine and cosine functions are of exponential order, and so on. So let's discuss a bit why exponential order is necessary. And we can do that by calculating the Laplace transform. So fs is equal to the Laplace transform of ft. And by the definition, this is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e minus st ft dt. So the whole point and the entire thing we worried about is that we need this integral to exist. In particular, we needed this integral to not go to infinity. So let's look at the absolute value of this Laplace transform. So it turns out that we can bring the absolute value sign inside the integral. And this, one, this, this is a technical point, but I'll just give a brief hand-wavy explanation of why this is true. The integral is related to the sign, to the sum function. And you can see that for any finite numbers, a plus b plus c is always going to be less than absolute value of a plus absolute value of b plus absolute value of c. So the sum, the absolute value of a sum is always going to be less than the sum of absolute values. And this is precisely what's going on here. So if you, this isn't that important for this explanation, but this is the why it's true. We can remove the exponentials, the absolute values, of course, because for one thing, a EIST is always positive, And we assume that FT is less than MECT. This is going to be a fairly straightforward integration. And we just have E, C minus S, T, C minus S from infinity to zero. This is going to be m times the limit as b goes to infinity of e c minus s b c minus s minus m e to the zero over c minus s. So we need to assume here that s that c minus s is negative. If we have this assumption, then this exponential goes to zero. If not, it goes to infinity. And we have m over s minus c. So s minus c minus s is less than zero is, is the same thing as saying that s greater than c. So this gives us a condition for our s. One thing to notice is that we have written down fs is less than m over s minus c. So indeed, our integral is finite, and the Laplace transform exists. One thing to note, and another thing to see is that this fs must go to zero as s goes to infinity. And it turns out that all Laplace transforms must have this property. They all have to go to zero as s goes to infinity.